couple of weeks ago, I got up here and talked about sex. <laughs> and it's that time of year where somebody, usually the minister, me, has to get up and talk about money. And it's harder to talk about money than sex. <laughs> and it is for a lot of people. It's one of the leading reasons marriages don't work out. It's money. And it always makes me wonder about what about church and our culture and who we are as a people makes talking about money so difficult. I had a member of a church a number of years ago, and his thing was, how can we better talk about money? So we can do the stewardship campaign well. This was his thing. When he volunteered at church, he liked to work on the fundraising. And he was good at it. And he was a, he was a good guy to be around and work with. And one year, he came back to me from travels he did at work. He, he worked for a bank and you know, he worked with money and they flew him all over the world to do <clears throat> trainings and work with their people in different places. And he came back from the Far East one year. He said, I gotta tell you a story. And he tells me this story. He says, so you know how when I'm traveling around I like to go to churches and places and, and see what they're like? Yeah, yeah. And you know how I tend to ask them about how they raise the money for the place, because I do the stewardship here. Yeah, yeah. And he had told me various stories about what he'd run into. He said, well, listen to what happened to me on this trip. I found a mosque. And this was somewhere in Asia. I forget it was Hong Kong or somebody. A place you wouldn't expect him to say, I went to a mosque. He said, I went to this mosque. And it, it was a holy day. And they were celebrating the sacrifice of Isaac. And because in it was the sacrifice of Ishmael. In Judaism, it's the sacrifice of Isaac. Muslims do the sacrifice of Ishmael. So there's this whole holiday going on, he said. And they invited me to stay and celebrate the holiday. And he said, wow, what an experience. And he said, you know, like I usually do, he tells me, I end up trying to ask who the president of the mosque is and who the imam is. And eventually I get to talk to the president of the mosque. And one of the questions I ask him as he's showing me around the mosque is, how do you get the money for the mosque? And the guy says, nothing. He just points to the door. And I'm like, what? Over by the door. What over by the door? You get money when people come in the door? I said, well, yeah, kind of. How? What's over by the door? And the guy walks him over there. And over by the door, he says, is a single wooden black box about that big. And he says, that's how you get money for the mosque. Yeah, people put money in the box. That's it? That's all you do? Like, you don't send a letter, you don't have a campaign, you don't do anything special here as an event? And the guy says, no. This is our mosque. Why wouldn't people give us everything we need? And that stunned him. And it stunned me when he told me. This is our mosque. Why wouldn't people give us everything we need? One of the pillars of Islam is zakat, charity, for those in need. And one of the ways people exercise their zakat was they put the money in the box by the door. No lock on the box. Just a hole in the top to put in their zakat. Everything they needed. A huge mosque. The only mosque in town, I mean, it's somewhere in Asia where Islam is not a thing, he came back, said, that was amazing. He said, let's try it. This year, we'll do a very different thing. We'll put the box up and tell the story. So we did. And four weeks later, we had a dollar and 62 cents in the box. <laughs> and we had to do the stewardship campaign again. <laughs> Why wouldn't our community give us everything we need? It's an entirely different concept of thinking about and talking about money in that particular culture, in that mosque. 
and probably in some other mosques too, for all I know. And honestly, it's a culture I haven't seen too often in churches. And not because people are not as good or not as holy or not as generous. I think it's a whole conception about giving and money and value and what we're comfortable doing and talking about. Our culture likes to equate wealth with goodness and self-esteem and success. In our culture, quite often, you are not a human being who has more or less of a financial resource. You are a lesser person or a better person based upon the financial resources. And yet, those we either consciously or subconsciously label the better people because of the financial resources that we try to get everybody to try and want to be in the American dream, there's going to be fewer and fewer and fewer of them and more and more and more and more and more of the rest of us. It's like a new feudalism is being born. Lord is the man and everybody else. And part of that kind of idolization of money in our culture just makes it hard to talk about. We don't want to feel bad that we're not as financially well off or skilled or understand financial matters as well as somebody else. We don't want to get into competitiveness because I earn this much money and someone else earns that much money. And sometimes we don't want to even want to see it as a gift. Hey, so-and-so is really skilled in this area. That's a gift. They do really well. The same way someone else is a good teacher or a good soccer player or a good musician. And therefore, we've created in our culture a culture that in many ways just doesn't like to talk about money. You know who talks about money all the time? Poor people. Because you have to talk about whether or not you're going to spend the money you have on food or the electric bill or gas for the car to get to work to have enough money to pay one of those other things but not the other. Being poor in our culture takes a lot of work. Being poor in our culture can be a full-time job. And yet, the attitude that gets promoted popular in our popular culture about people who are poor is that they're takers and they don't give back and they're lazy and, you know, try being poor and do what you need to get things for what you have to do to succeed. If you did it for your business, we'd say, what a great business person. But if you used your evolutionarily developed skills to make sure you had food and scrambled to pay this bill or that bill and got some other benefit that you needed to make it, somehow that's not seen as being intelligent and resourceful. I've lived and worked among that population, <coughs> and people are smart and resourceful. Sometimes when we don't talk about money, it's for one simple reason. We have the privilege of not having to, for one reason or another. I think one of the things that formed a lot of the way I think about money was just the way I grew up. I grew up without a lot of money, which I didn't really notice at the time. God bless my mother, a single mom with two boys. Um, but there was never a lot of extra money. You know, we always heard we can't afford that, we don't have money for that, we can't afford that, we don't have money for that. But it wasn't something that I thought about too often. It was like, oh, I don't have money for that. You know, we always had money for the shoes we needed for baseball or whatever, but not a ton of anything else above and beyond. When we had a lot of extra money, as I got older, I realized it because my mom was taking us out for Chinese food. And we did not go out to eat very much when I was growing up. As I got older, into college and stuff, I, I learned, which I never knew, that you know the reason we had a house to live in is my mom's aunts were frequently paying the mortgage. And I learned later when I both worked with people, I need to help find food stamps, and then later spent a year on food stamps myself, that, oh, we grew up on food stamps. I didn't know that growing up. I learned that much later when I was an adult. And yet, the culture of giving was also something I grew up with. When I got into high school, I learned that my mom had been doing something for years. Um, with the little that she had, we had had a babysitter after my parents got divorced, 
and who was wonderful. My brother and I loved her. My mom thought she was great. And eventually she moved away and ran into some hard times. And every Christmas for years, my mom sent her $100 cash anonymously. I never knew that until I got out of college. And yet that was evident in the way I grew up, that you were just generous as you could be all the time, no matter what you had. I got my first glimpse of not having a lot of money and poverty when I was in grade school and this family moved in. And it, it's almost cliche and, and a stereotypical evaluation to try and describe them to you, but. The kids came to school in ripped jeans, no shoes, ripped t-shirts. I remember the boy in my class actually wore a rope for a belt. They were frequently dirty. And I remember asking my mom about them. And she said, a lot of people have a lot less than us. And I don't think I understood it the way I understand it now. But I did understand it enough at that time I remember saying, wow, that's a lot less than us. Because although there wasn't a lot of money in our house, we were not relationally poor. We had family that helped. We had neighbors that helped. We had a situation where my mom had a job where her employers were kind and helped. And there was lots of extra time off and working here or there for the single mom. When I got older, I realized this impacted me in various ways, how I grew up with money. One of the churches I first worked at was in a rather wealthy suburb of Boston. And I remember as I started working there, I was trying to get people involved to do things in the worship service. And people were very kind and everything, but a lot of them politely declined. And after having one of these Sundays go by where I couldn't get anybody to help out do some of these things, and I had all these great creative ideas, what we're going to do on Sunday morning, one of the leaders of the congregation tugged me aside and said, you know, don't take it personally. He said, just remember that in, in the community here, there's a lot of people who pay people to help with their children, cook their meals, mow their lawn. And in some way, although I don't think it's conscious, this person says to me, we pay people to pray for us, too. And he didn't mean it as a criticism of his congregation. He was just trying to help me understand the culture into which I was trying to serve. And I got all indignant. And then I realized I had a lot of prejudices towards rich people. And it really stinks having to confront your own prejudices. It's a bummer. It's like, damn, I thought I was a better person than that. No, just like everybody else, you got your stuff. And so one of the gifts I got from working there is I learned that money is a gift. And being able to handle and understand money is a gift like other people have gifts. And some of us are good at some things, and some of us aren't as good at things. Some of us are better at this, and others at this. And I don't think I understood that until I worked at that church. And I also saw that, no, money does not bring happiness, even if you do know where to shop. Most people know where to shop. <laughs> because depression is everywhere, and loss is everywhere, and grief is everywhere. And there's a lot in the human condition that no matter how much money you have, it's not going to help any. And so I get filled with wonder and fascination, I think, every year at stewardship time, and you got to talk about money. As if there's some magical way to talk about money that is spiritually enlightening and not too much of a hard sell. And you don't want to dwell on it too much because there's a lot of the human condition we do have to cater to here besides money. The only time in all the work I've done with churches that a family left the church and told the board the reason they were leaving was me. It was one time in Texas, a young family left, and the couple wrote a letter to the board and said, we're leaving because Reverend Tony does not believe in capitalism. Mm -hmm. And I told the board, well, at least they were listening. 
<laughs> now, our culture is just so strange about money. You know, one in every two Americans makes less than $32,000 a year. And $32,000 a year isn't as much money as it once used to be. You pay me generously more than that. And yet, if you had told me when I graduated from college that someday I would be making a salary, you are kindly paying me. And I would still be worrying about money month to month with bills and college tuition and all kinds of other stuff. I would have laughed. I really would have laughed, I think. Because at that time, that amount of money would have seemed like a king's ransom compared to how I grew up. Now, granted, that amount of money is not what it was 30 years ago, like any amount, but still, having been someone who's gone through unemployment and underemployment, money's really real. And the more we can talk about it, and the more openly we can talk about it, and the less shame we have around it, whether we have resources or we don't have any resources, the better we are, and the better we are as a community together. I learned, that I think, the hard way as an adult that how much money I'm making, how much money I had growing up, and how much money someone else has does not mean anyone's a better or lesser person. But maybe the ability for us to talk about it and be honest, maybe that's where we work on ourselves as being the better people we want to be. Our religious history plays a lot into this, too. Unitarians were the wealthy Brahmin people of the East Coast cities. And they had a theology of character, salvation by character. If you lived the right way and were intelligent and did the right things, you would be prosperous. It's almost like this prosperity gospel for non-Trinitarians, you know, in the 19th century. And yet, the opposite side of our tradition is the Universalists, who were backwards preachers in New Hampshire, in the Connecticut River Valley, in the Blackstone River Valley. <coughs> and one of the interesting things about the culture of our church is it has a real historical mingling and interweaving of these two strands. And just as um, some of the Unitarians at the time, you know, if you put William Ellery Channing, our Unitarian, you know, hotshot, and Hosea Ballou and Aiden Ballou together in a room with them, they both would have looked at the other side and said, ah, there's Unitarians, ah, there's Universalists. And I think we have some of that tension still running in Unitarian Universalist congregations about finances and the approach to money and class and culture. We make a little too much, I think, maybe, of the American dream. One in two people born wealthy in this country will be wealthy adults, and one in two people who are born into poverty in this country will be in poverty as adults. There's some movement around, but it's not as much as you'd like to think. And we like to think our culture is one where you can make it if you work hard and try, and yet lots of people work very hard and try very hard, and still systemically they're stuck in something that doesn't let them make it. I used to teach this by having people play Monopoly. Are you familiar with Monopoly? Right? So to teach this, I'd have people play a game of Monopoly. Everybody starts out with the same money and their token, and you buy and sell and you learn capitalism, and whoever does it best kind of bankrupts everybody else and wins. But everyone starts out with an equal shot and an equal playing field, right? And we think that's the world we live in, but it's not. We live in a world of the second game I'd have them play, where player one begins the game with five times the usual money, owns all the rich properties with hotels and all of them, owns all the utilities and railroads, and progressively player three and two own less and have less till player four starts the game with a token and that's it. And the world we live in is, you know, where and when you're born into everything really matters. Is it possible for the person who started the Monopoly game with just the token to win? Yeah, it's possible. Is it likely? No matter how hard they play or how good they're at it playing? No. So all this stuff goes into what we bring to church to think about and talk about money. And maybe if church is going to be church, we have to be as countercultural 
about money as we are about things like social justice. When it wasn't the cultural mainstream to be accepting of our gay and lesbian, bisexual, and transgender brothers and sisters, we decided to go that way. When it wasn't mainstream to stand up for racial equality, we decided to go that way. And maybe as our culture becomes increasingly a culture of those at the very tip top and everybody else, where money is an idol, maybe it's countercultural of us to do that differently too. The people who started the Hopedale community were a collective. They were all in it together to make it work. The people at the mosque, unspoken in a box by the door, were all in it together through their charity. So this year, our first step towards a better relationship with money, reconciling with money, making it easier to talk about and discuss and make plans for money in the church, our first step is this year, we want to all be in it together. In a countercultural move towards our society, we want everyone, in a sense, to buy in together. We want everyone to make sure they are giving something to the church in matters of your time and volunteering. Make one thing happen here. Be a person or part of a team that makes just one thing happen here and make work for everybody else. And make a financial donation. According to your means. But what if we all did it? Giving as much or as little as our income and availability and time allow. But we all pledge that we're all in for both. The Hopedale community worked when it worked because everyone was all in it together. The mosque worked and paid for everything because they were all in it together. And so are we. <laughs>